Your own example is your best leverage to change the behavior of others. What does that mean to you, Casey Diaz? My own example. I think I would say character. You know, you, you could uh, have a great education. You could soar like an eagle. But if your character sucks, I mean, how far are you going to go? Uh, so for me, I, I think uh, towards that question, it has to do with character. Uh, how I uh, react to things, how I act both in the public and in my own, you know, where, where the people that I love or the people that, uh, when nobody's watching, mm -hmm. that's true character. Yeah. Are you the same person in the eye of everyone and in close quarters with the people that are closest to you? It's character, man. Yeah, and that's, that's very... Um tough for most to do to be a good person even when nobody's looking but yeah. i'm honored to be here with you today casey diaz um welcome to the how to battle podcast and um here we interview people who've been through incredible battles and are now successful are now doing good in this world and i believe living their purpose and that's what i believe success is is finding what you are really really in love with and passionate about and being able to do that every day so that's what I think success is, and I'm honored to have Casey Diaz here today, who is uh, also uh, a podcaster uh, of the Shot Caller podcast, um, an incredible podcast, um, and actually was a big inspiration for me in the beginning stages to start a podcast. You were one of the ones. Um, he's also an author of um, the Shot Caller and your second book. Uh, okay, I will. Okay, I will. And just the name alone, like it's like <laughs> calls you, you know, because. Yeah. Um, it's such a powerful, uh, short phrase. It can have so much meaning. Yeah. Um, but aside from author and podcaster, speaker, and uh, father, husband, and I believe most important of all, man of God. That's it, man. Right? Servant. Yes, servant yes. of God. And That's it. <laughs> um, so thank you for doing this interview. I'm honored to be here at your beautiful um, office with your the artwork that you did. Um, that when you walk in here, you just feel inspired. So uh, let's start, um, like most things in the beginning, um, tell those who may not know who you are, um, you know, your story. And I guess along the journey of your story, those impact events that might've steered you to go certain directions in life. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I find that, that, that there's a similar pattern to a lot of, uh, the folks that uh, come from similar backgrounds, uh, such as ours, uh, incarceration, uh, life of crime, uh, gangs, and all that, uh, very similar from one to maybe different in subject matter or reasoning, but I find it very interesting that, you know, there's always a missing dad or missing, or a, a dad that maybe is there, but physically, but emotionally, spiritually is absent. Uh, so for me, growing up in L.A. in the Rampart District of Los Angeles, uh, started very normal. It, it was cool, you know, mm -hmm. growing up as a kid. I still remember uh, uh, Hoover Elementary. Uh, that's where it's, it all started. <laughs> you know, walking to school. I remember my grandma uh, walking me the first day of school. And, uh, and then the second day, she walks me to the corner and says, uh, you know, you know how to get there, right? And I looked at her puzzled, and I think I was in either first grade or kindergarten. I don't yeah. remember which one it was, but when she popped that question, it was almost like I had to say yes. Yeah. And I said, yeah. And I walked to school, you know, and that was a time <laughs> where uh, yeah. we all walked to school. Yeah, it's so the norm. It was a normal thing, man. So, you know, I, I remember the fun time. The mm -hmm. I want to say the, like the innocence of growing up in, in that time. Uh, gangs had really, they existed, but they hadn't taken over Los Angeles up until later on. Mm -hmm. So I think from uh, kinder to fifth grade, pretty much normal kid stuff, you know. Uh, with the only, the only thing for me was that I had a violent father at home mm -hmm. that I hated, go I hated going home. 
Mm-hmm. That was the one thing that I, I'll, it's like plastered in the back of my memory bank. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you, you think that it shouldn't affect you mm-hmm. now or it shouldn't, you know. But I, I believe that some trauma takes a long time, man, to, yeah. to work through. Yeah. You know, for me, it was, you know, watching my mom, man, just getting mm-hmm. pummeled. Uh, you know, to seeing your dad, your biological dad, uh, stepping on your mom's face, on her ribs, and blood splattering everywhere, and you're 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 trying to defend her and you can't. Yeah. Going home to that was that that was difficult. Yeah. Uh, but then you know, then you put a, a mask. I think I started putting on that mask very early on. Because I knew what had had happened at home, but then it's the next morning and you got to go to school. Yeah. And play it off like you're just, you know, nothing out of the ordinary has happened. Yeah. So that 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 was yeah. yeah, That's I think that's where my mask started to uh, take place and where. Yeah. Yeah. And what year was that? Oh man. Because I'm like like. I know, like we have probably an age difference between us. I don't yeah. know. Um, I don't even know how old 52. you are. That's when you're 52, and you don't yeah. even look it. Like I would have never guessed that. And some people say prison preserves you. Yeah, you believe, you believe that? <laughs> I think so, man. Yeah, it's an ice box, so, bro. Right? Yeah, it's an ice box, and you just sit there, and you because you don't look. Hey, that's why I asked. Like, is this the 80s, 70s we're talking about? We're uh, in the 70s. Uh, yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, mid to late 70s. And that's when, like. Like, well, because gang banging came a little bit around that time, right? Or later? Yeah, I'd say about later um, because break dancing came in like in 82, 83. Oh, okay. Uh, and then yeah. right after that was yeah. the tagging, the graffiti. Yeah. And on the tail end of that was where gangs just boom mm. exploded in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, yeah. that, that was about that time. Yeah. yeah. I was born in 83. So, like, I was oh my born gosh. around the time. Yeah. I was born. <laughs> I was born around the time when the Getty first started coming up, but I know from like the older homies telling me like how it used to be, like it was just yeah. way tougher. Um, <laughs> you know, it meant something more than what it means today. Yeah, like um, I know for me, like in the '90s, I became a gang member, and it meant like so much more than just a gang. It was like a brotherhood. Yeah, it was my family, the people that I would die for, and really loved and cared about. And nowadays, I feel like that is not how it is anymore you know no. it's so different so um growing up in that environment at in in um, when they first started how was it like for the people who may wonder when in those initial stages when it was beginning oh man it, it, it was a a brotherhood yeah it was um i mean my first introduction was and i'll never forget i know exactly where it happened it was an older uh brother of one of our friends um and you know he was graffitiing on the on the sidewalk yeah. and gang writing. Yeah. And I approached him, and uh, I said, "Well, what are you writing?" Because I thought it would it was like graffiti, graffiti, but it wasn't. It was gang writing. Yeah. And he says, "Oh, this is a neighborhood." And I said, "Well, what is that all about?" And and he pitched the perfect. This dude was a closer, man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he, sold, he, sold it well, he, huh? he sold me the goods, and yeah. I bought into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he says, uh, "Oh, this is." The neighborhood, yeah. you know, we protect each other. We're family, you know. We go out. Mm-hmm. We're one unit, right. uh, and, and just hearing that, and mind you, out in, in my apartment where we lived, that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. It didn't feel like the, that was the case. Yeah, because there was, you know, brutality. There was yeah. just violence. Yeah. Uh, so that didn't feel like family. So hearing him saying, you know, we protect each other, mm. we're, there's a bond, there we're a unit, those were words that were just, just boom, you know, landing in the right place in, in, in what I would have considered back then good soil yeah. for the, those words to land. So I didn't see the gang culture as some, an outsider would see it. I saw it as, oh, no, this is a good thing. And then I, I started seeing, you know, the cars coming to pick him up and uh, the mm-hmm. girls yeah. and the parties. It, 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 it looked like fun. Yeah. Yeah, to be honest with you, it just looked like fun. And I thought, 
I could do this. And, you know, here we go. That's, that's where I always got started. Yeah, and, you know, it's like going back to your childhood, um, well, probably during this time as well, dealing with what you were doing with at home, like knowing that you hated to go home. So in, in essence, you know, when you were outside of the home, you're like susceptible to be pulled in a direction that's going to keep you from the home. Right. So yeah. it's like I, that's kind of what it was for me, too, you know, like wanting to get away from that and explore more. And then once I found um, something that I felt like I could belong to be accepted in, I, I clung to it. And so uh, when you were telling me that, it kind of reminded me of that. And um, so when did like the crime start for you, like when you start committing crime leading up to your crime and then how, um, you know, you went into prison because. I really don't know your story, like, as far as the prison part, um, because I wanted to hear it from you here today. I love, like, that spontaneity, like, things just to be open about it. So, yeah. Um, uh, For me, uh, crime started uh, almost immediately. And just like anybody else uh, that has lived a gang life, it starts with a little crime, right? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the end of fifth grade, I'm already stealing stuff from 7-Eleven in in my book, uh, yeah. I write, I mean, it's in chronological order, uh, it, and it's practically baby steps yeah. into bigger crime. Mm-hmm. So from going into 7-Eleven, stealing chips and candy, you know, and <laughs> even now, I, I, I just, you know, remembering those moments, you know, I would buy a Slurpee, you know, uh, and, and an empty Slurpee yeah. uh, cup, and uh, and back then, there was, it was teenagers that, yeah. that uh, were at the service counters. Yeah. Uh, so I'd put the candies in there and then go to the slippery machine and then pull the lever. So Wow, that's pretty clever. It, it was clever, man, yeah, you know? that's clever. And yeah. so I'm only paying for the Slurpee, Dang. but <laughs> it's yeah. full of M&M's, yeah, you know, yeah. Willy Wonka, you know, <laughs> <That's a good laughs> and everything else in there. Yeah. So that, that mentality, you know, that thinking uh, s- started happening very, very quick. Yeah. But my first... Uh, I would, you know, I went to stealing cars, Mm -hmm. did that. I never did a a burglary. I I didn't like that. Uh, But the the stealing cars happened really quick. But my my first major crime where it involved harming somebody was with uh, a buddy of mine, a homeboy of mine, Mm -hmm. who was a very uh, influential person in the gang. He was, I would say, the most influential even to this day. Mm-hmm. He's like a street legend back then. Mm-hmm. And he took me to jump somebody. And I didn't know what his plans were. Mm-hmm. I thought, yeah. we're just jumping this dude, and that's it. And he took out a screwdriver mm-hmm. and starts stabbing this guy. Mm-hmm. And then hands it to me while the dude's in the ground. Mm-hmm. And says, you know, your turn. Uh, yeah. What are you going to say? You're yeah. not going to say no. You're not going to say no. You're going to grab that screwdriver and use it. Yeah. And so that was, and I was 11 years old when that happened. Mm. So this is, you know, here, here goes my demise yeah. into the violence. And right. this is where it starts to get real. I mean, 11 years old, man, that, that's, yeah. it's a baby. Yeah, that's a baby, know? yeah. Yeah, man. That's deep. And it's like introducing you to things that you've never felt before, that feeling of like power that you get from oh, yeah. doing that, you know, and, it, and then recognition and respect from those that we looked up to. It only fueled it more and more and more, man. Oh, and, it's, it's putting gas, you know, and tipping the, the, the tank. Yeah, absolutely. Did you always feel like you had a, like a, like you were born as a leader? I mean, you're, you were a shot caller and in a way you still are. You're, you got your own businesses you're doing right in your own book you're taking control of your own life but you're a shot caller you know to your life and um god as well or something you know i mean it's different now but i feel like you have that like that energy of a person that would be in a leadership position did you always feel that or like evolved later uh, i think um uh, i think it's a, a a mixture of of certain things i think it's dangerous when you pat somebody so much in the uh, in the back, you know, mm-hmm. and in the streets, you know, hearing your big homeboys take you in and, and that pat in the back, man. Hey, that was that was good, you know. That mm-hmm. those words, man. Uh, words have power. Yeah, you know, this is why book writing and 
it, it's they're selling. Yeah. People lo love stories, and it involves words. So you you use the right words, and it could influence people mm -hmm. in whatever direction. So for me, I think that, that's you know hearing, uh, and then hearing my enemies back then, you know, uh, your name starts to float around, mm -hmm. and yeah, your head gets big, man, and <laughs> all for the wrong reasons. Uh, but yeah, you, you, I, I think later on uh, in life is when I, I started to see there was leadership in there. It just wasn't in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that big question, right? Are leaders born or made? Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a combination of two things. You know, you're born uh, a leader, but then there's some things that shape you yeah. uh, to becoming a good leader and that could act actually work out <laughs> for your benefit mm -hmm. or for destruction and yeah. so I, I look back at, at moments where I see you know yeah that was a le leadership move mm -hmm. that was definitely a leadership move and and um, unfortunately for me I used it for the wrong all for the wrong reasons yeah yeah, I agree. I think um, that like leaders can be made, but like I think that if you're like a great leader or you're meant to be a leader, then you're born with the qualities or certain things and then you develop it. That's right. You know what I mean? I, I So I get, yeah, I completely agree with that because I know um, many different leaders and I've like kind of like, you know, take, really took an analysis of them and their personalities and their backgrounds and I've noticed that that um, the ones that were meant to be leaders where you feel like this person is a leader had always had something there from when they're childhood and then you have those that are just developing into leaders and know how to take on that persona and the message to deliver it and lead people so it's a difference yeah yeah for yeah. sure so take me into your like journey into prison like when you first entered how it was back in those days um, how you ended up going to the shoe and becoming a shot caller like those pivotal moments in your life that uh, led up to you um, having your encounter with change, which we'll get to after. Yeah. Yeah. So my first, um, and I think I'd have to backtrack to what that last question was. Yeah. You start to see so many, so many people putting your name in the hat, you know, uh, from Juna Hall to camps. Mm -hmm. And it was always, you, you, looking back now, yeah. you, I remember being that leader of the pack in dorms, mm. in modules. Yeah, you know, and, and eventually at sixteen, I was looking at life without parole. Uh, my case took, uh, by the grace of God, took a, a good turn, mm. and I was able to, you know, I went through two trials that were mistrials, which wow. that's huge. So rare, as you know, yeah, that yeah. is humongous, man. Yeah. That's almost unheard of. Yeah. But my first trial was uh, eight four, uh, eight mm -hmm. guilty, four not guilty. Mm -hmm. They went, they refiled. Uh, so we went to a second trial, and that one was eleven one, <sighs> eleven guilty, one not guilty. Wow. And uh, the DA was uh, hesitant to refile, but mm -hmm. they were about to refile again. And you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if you did your time here in Los Angeles. I did. Yeah. Okay. So LA County Jail, you're yeah. in. You know, I was in twenty four hundred. Uh, I don't know if that still exists, but that was old Max in Wayside. And they wake you up early in the morning. Mm -hmm. You're in chains really early. Yep. Half of I don't know if you, if, I don't know if you were like me, but most of the time I wasn't even paying attention to what, what was happening in court. Yeah. I was tired. Yeah. I didn't care. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just, you're there, whatever, right? And um, I was more tired of going through this trial than anything else. Mm. I wasn't paying attention to the details. Yeah. I cared less. I was, you know, all about the gang thing, and and that's all yeah. I cared about. And uh, when they were about to refile again, my public defender. But by the way, I didn't have a, a private attorney at this yeah. time. Couldn't afford that. <laughs> yeah, and none of us could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, she says to me, you know, we should take it again. Let's fight it. You have a good chance. 
Mm-hmm. And but you know you're looking at your first trial is 25 to life, you know, and then the next one is 15 to life, and you look at that L, and you're mm-hmm. going so long as that L was there, yeah, it's not a good deal. No, it's not. It's not a good deal. So I asked her. I said, so uh, if I plead guilty, and and we don't go for it, what, what what's the offer on the table? Mm-hmm. I paid attention to to that part. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So she went and talked yeah. to the DA. DA came back fairly quickly yeah. uh, with a uh, almost 13-year sentence without the L. And so I jumped on it. I jumped okay. on it in a heartbeat yeah. and uh, took it. And the next thing I know, you know, but, so I'm in uh, Wayside mm-hmm. in, in Old Max. And from there, uh, all of a sudden, man, this influence again. You know, all, everybody that's from L.A. knows everybody. Back then... And even <laughs> I think today, right? Everybody yeah. knows everybody. Yeah. The the prison culture and yeah. it's its own city. It's its own community. It's exactly. You screw up, it's gonna follow it's you. It's gonna follow you, no matter uh, where you're at. No matter where you're at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you're a good dude, mm-hmm. that's gonna follow you. Yeah. So here goes my name mm-hmm. in the in the hat again uh, while I was there, and the next thing I know, uh, you know, you're running yeah. an entire dorm. And these are dorms where they're housing everyone that's in there for murder, yeah. kidnapping, robberies, yeah. all violent criminals. And for them to throw your name in the hat, yeah. that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, once these deputies get wind of that, yeah. and they're looking at your jacket, everybody's, there's gang intelligence in there, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, next thing I know, man, I'm getting rolled up to... Uh, the gang module, and once you're in, your, in the gang module, there's yeah. no coming back from that. Yeah. You know, once you're suited in that clown suit, that's it, man. You're yeah. you're you're going places. Yeah. And so I ended up going there, and then catching the chain to uh, North Kern State Prison, Delano. Mm-hmm. I did my uh, my little reception there. Yeah. And then uh, caught the chain to New Folsom, mm. and in New Folsom, I end up in the B yard. And the BR that back then was just, it was vicious. It was mm. housing yeah. some of the worst uh, of the worst. Yeah. And so, you know, you come in there, it's a whole new city, man. You walk in there, and I remember day one, I don't know if you felt the same way, but I'm going <laughs> to keep it real. You see those walls? And you see all the, yeah. uh, we used to call them Ninja Turtles. I don't know if, you, if that's they what they were. They still call them Ninja Turtles. Really? <laughs> yeah, 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 still. But, but you see them along the wall. The yeah. bus comes in. Yeah. The wall is high. You know, you got all these gunners there. And in my mind, I thought, that's it, man. Yeah. I screwed up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're in the big leagues. Now. Yeah, this, oh, is, this is real. You this know, is yeah. this is it. And I remember uh, I got taken out of the bus and separated. Yeah, that that was another thing, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, usually they don't separate you. But yeah. here I go getting separated yeah. and into a room uh, and interviewed. And yeah. uh, that was it, man. Uh, straight to uh, AdSeg. And, you know, yeah. so so it's it, it, you, you look at these moments yeah. and inside you, you still don't care. But. There's still that cinch of mm-hmm. fear that this is not a game anymore. Yeah. This is this is costing your life and you're gonna be asked to do things. Yeah. It's not like, you know, it's not like YA, it's not yeah. like, you know, Camp Miller or yeah. or whatever camp you ever went to. This is real now. This is a life and death situation and you're gonna be asked and told to do certain things. Yeah. So you know, it was a different, I think it was a different era where there was still, it was very organized. Uh, there was no playing around. Uh, it, it was serious. And, you know, walking in there uh, just opened my mind to, uh, I think the violence that I was so used to committing mm-hmm. and the violence that started in my apartment with my father, yeah. that contributed to how I, the mannerisms, uh, how I acted uh, towards certain things. So violence was, e- it was easy to, to, to do. 
but you're still yeah that thought is in there yeah, that, that thinking, you, yeah, yeah. And, and the the real thing is even when you're a shock color yeah. somebody might not like you yeah and the chances are very high that somebody's looking to see you make one mistake mm -hmm. and and they want that you know they want that they're looking for that uh, and I know that in the county jail, I, I almost screwed up twice. Mm -hmm. And that could have uh, caused a lot of uh, danger upon my life. Yeah. Uh, but again, you know, you, you have this, I think we become master manipulators uh, when we're in the game in there. Yeah. And you know how to talk yourself in and out of things. Yeah. You know, because I was caught red-handed doing something that I shouldn't have been doing uh, yeah. while I was in there. Uh, one of them was taxing the paisas back then. Mm. This is. I went in the, in a time where the Border Brother car had just was assembling yeah. it, themselves, and there was only three cars really. Yeah. You had the Black Guerrilla family, Mexican Mafia, and Aryan Brotherhood, yeah. and then you had the Southsiders, and you know. Mm -hmm. But really, it was only three, uh, and the Border Brothers had just started to, you know, make a name for themselves, and at that time, I didn't like them. Mm. I didn't like. Uh, uh, I, I saw fear yeah. in, in a lot of them, right. uh, and uh, so uh, without telling anyone, and this could have got me killed. I know that for a fact. Yeah. You know that for a yeah. fact. Uh, taxing yeah. a whole entire, you know, uh, person mm -hmm. uh, without the permission of anybody. Yeah. Just doing it. Just doing it. Uh, can that's, cost your yeah, life. That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. And yeah. you're playing with fire. Yeah. And somehow I was able to talk myself out. And a lot of it had to do with, because I was questioned about it yeah. by another, uh, well, two other dudes that were influential yeah. who put my name in the hat. Yeah. And they came up to me. You know, yeah. Won't mention their names. They yeah. know who they are. <laughs> uh, and they, they asked me, yeah. well, you, you know, you were taxing these dudes? Yeah. And I played it off. I said, Nah, yeah. dude. You think I would do that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a, a smirk in his face, like, yeah. I know you. I know you're doing it, but there was so much love for, yeah. You know, uh, the, and again, that the, that LA name. Mm -hmm. You know, when your name is known on the streets and inside, a, a lot of there, there's a lot of um, people that do like you. Yeah. And in my case, I was fortunate enough that these two dudes were different gangs. Uh, had a liking to me yeah. and kind of, you know, put it under the rug kind of thing yeah. where it didn't, but had it been someone else, that could have been very dangerous for me. Yeah. But So yeah, the, the, that whole culture, man. Uh, so it, different. It was very different. Yeah. Uh, I think the, I think we had the lowest, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just talk for like the South Side car. I think we had the lowest uh as far as snitching and mm -hmm. ratting, I mean, nobody talked, man. Yeah. I mean, I have homeboys that are still there and didn't even commit the crime. Yeah. But just, they refuse to talk. Yeah. And, and they'll go to the grave with yeah. what they know. Yeah. You know? So I, it's different. It was different, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's crazy because, like, we know in prison is, there's so many ugly things that happen in there. Like, um, we I'm pretty sure you've experienced multiple murders in there and seeing that and witnessing mm -hmm. that and me too. And, um, but I also, I feel like that a lot of people that think about prison, they automatically equate nothing but violence and negative from there, which I mean, there's so much of that, yeah. but there's like moments that were like really like, like beautiful moments that I saw while I was in there from people like, like for instance, like, uh, I remember when I was in the hole one time, um, I didn't have anything to eat. And a, and a gentleman down the tier that I didn't even know gave me half his soup. And it made me literally like think of, you know, like, man, like I don't have any family looking out for me right now. Yeah. I don't have anything. But this stranger who understands what I'm going through, like gave me half his soup. He had one left. He had store coming. That's a, that's a big deal. You know what I'm saying? So like that was a moment where like I, it, it, it makes me think on those. Because I could always look at the negative and, the, and all the violence, talk about that. People kind of, but like what is something that you may have uh, experienced in prison that you feel kind of like highlights maybe like um, the goodness within somebody or in a situation maybe. So, and this has happened after uh, my conversion uh, mm -hmm. into Christianity. 
Um, uh, you know, back then, having a radio, uh, that was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, having a Walkman, you know, and, and yeah. I remember uh, this one cat, uh, you know, I, I was shunned. Mm-hmm. I, I had walked away from the game and the whole nine yards. Yeah. And then, again, in the book, it, it details everything that I had to go through uh, for stepping away from that. Yeah. But I remember this one cat uh, handing me his Walkman. You know, yeah. and you know, with fresh batteries, and yeah. he's like, hey, "Here you go," because he knew that I was in a bad situation. Mm-hmm. That you know, it, it was just, it was all bad. Yeah, and um, he just hands it to me. That's that's huge, man. Back yeah. then, it was a huge move. Yeah. So I saw that that type of kindness. Yeah. And and the dude was a be- uh, a believer as well. He's a Christian as yeah. well. So he, he was uh, one of those guys that. Uh, that showed me the human side of prison, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because I wasn't used to that. Yeah. Uh, in there is, again, you know, it is 90% yeah. violence and doggy doggy uh, world, you know, that it's, it's mm-hmm. all that. But then you have these cats, and I don't know if the guy, that, the fellow mm-hmm. that, that split the soup with you uh, was a Christian or not, whatever it was, but yeah. for me, that's what I saw kindness from. These dudes that had turned their lives over, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, and there were some of them were older, yeah, some of them were just about my age, but that was one that was one that I remember. I remember them uh, giving me books, you know, yeah. uh, and I love to read, yeah. so handing me books and and getting certain things for me, yeah, uh, knowing that at that time, uh, them associating with me on this yard could cost them. Yeah, some you know some pain as well. Yeah, but they risked it, and I I I, I understood that, yeah. and took notice that this is it's not just the Walkman. Yeah, it's not just you know the books. It's them, you know, if they get caught. Exactly, it's the act they put their life basically on the line. Yeah, for you to help you. Yeah, you know, man, that's uh that's powerful. But that's exactly what I was like, you know, wanting to like you know, be able to convey is that yeah. like there's some moments in it that I'll never forget that helped to mold me into the person I am today. Cause yeah. you know, like, like I grew up in prison, I became a man in there, you know? And so, um, I learned a lot of bad things, but I also learned good qualities that were just, I was generating, you know, in a, in a wrong way, yeah. you know, like, but I still to this day have some of the same qualities, like, yeah. you know, um, keeping your word you know that was huge in prison right <laughs> that'll get you killed or yeah <laughs> exactly so i still do that like i'm like okay but that was something i learned that's important in that yeah. world it's just as important out here absolutely you know what i mean so yeah. um i like to talk about those type of situations but share your conversion um with us here like you were just fully involved in that life committed to it um you gave your whole life for that you know, the gang and, um, and the position you had been in. And then you have this conversion, right? Yeah, man. Uh, I was in the shoe and, uh, and at this particular moment, I was already uh, about 18 months in there. Uh, and this prison ministry that came from uh, South Central Los Angeles, mm-hmm. from Adams, mm-hmm. and took a drive all the way to Sacramento oh. at, at once a month. And... Uh, to spend time with dudes in the shoe program yeah. uh, in there. And I remember uh, this lady, and that's her name right there, Francis Proctor. Francis Proctor. And what does that say up there? Jesus loves you and he's going to use you. That's amazing. Uh, and this lady, man, she was uh, from Louisiana, born in Louisiana. So she had a southern draw to her speech. Mm-hmm. And a couple of cells down, uh, there was a conversation with the CEO and her and they're going from cell to cell you know trying to yeah and they're only spending about four five six minutes per cell so it's yeah. not like they have all day to yeah to talk to inmates yeah it's uh you've seen it yeah uh so she's being discouraged by the ceo to approach my cell okay uh, you know you don't want nothing to do with that that kind of thing yeah. and that was out of pocket because there's, there was a mutual respect between 
certain CEOs. Mm -hmm. But then there was this, that one CEO that hot-headed. We, yeah. we, we all know who that yeah. dude is, yeah. right? And the shift that he's on. Yeah. Uh, so. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was that guy yeah. on that day. And she just wouldn't give up, man. Yeah. She says, uh, can I approach a cell? And she's allowed to. And how I knew that. And so I didn't even know that they were talking about me. It wasn't yeah. until he said, that's Diaz. And, you know, outside of your cell, there's your yeah. name. So there's my name right there. And I'm the only Diaz there. Yeah. Uh, so she approaches. And um, we start a conversation. And as soon as she tar started to pitch Jesus at me, I was like, nah. Right. Uh, yeah, cut that out. You know, little. And she's like about five foot two black lady. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I cut her off very respectfully, but I didn't want no, nothing to do with religion or anything like that. And she was just very, she could not take a no for an answer. Yeah. And she said, you know, I'm going to put you on my hit list. That's what she said. And, you know, in there, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a word that yeah, <laughs> you might not want to use. Language, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she said, I'm going to put you on my prayer hit list. Yeah. Because Jesus loves you and he's going to use you. Mm. Those were those words. And I thought, man, this lady's nuts, man. Yeah. She, she doesn't know where she's at. She doesn't know who's in front of her. You know, just being a little knucklehead, I'm young. Yeah. You know, I've arrived <laughs> at this place. Because yeah. that's, you know, we all yeah. look for that spot, right? Yep. And uh, so she says to me, right before she left, she goes, uh, are you okay if, when we come here, if I stop and just say hi to you and pray for you? And I remember telling her, I said, you can do whatever you want. I'm just letting you know, you know, what you're selling, I'm not buying. Mm -hmm. like, I don't want no part of that. But you're more than welcome to stop by. And so she did. Every month, once a month, she was so consistent. Mm -hmm. These are these things that, yeah. that I took notice of. The consistency, the keeping of your yeah. word, right? Right. She did that. She did that. Uh, and so the last Thursday of the month, she was there, man, without a miss. Right. Year after year, and uh, in that cell, I would experience something that was yeah. very supernatural on my own with nobody else, you know, in that cell that would change my whole entire life uh, yeah. from that moment forward. Uh, it was an encounter with the Lord, and, you know, I, uh, it was, uh, you're faced mm -hmm. with the reality of who you really truly are. And I think that now as an adult, as a believer, and I look at the Bible and I see the scriptures telling us, you know, there's no none, there's no one that is good. No, not one. Mm -hmm. Like no one. That's a big statement for God to have written that uh, in that Bible. Yeah. There's none that does good. No, not one. Man. All. Deep, yeah. So he says, all, all have gone astray. Yeah. No one is looking for a relationship with God. That's what that's saying. Yeah. And I, you know, I think about that and I go, wow, man, that's, that includes everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that includes that 90 year old lady that's been in church all her life. Mm -hmm. She's no good. In the eyes of God, mm. she's sinful. You know, and, and that became a, a level playing field for me to look mm -hmm. at that it wasn't I was bad because of my crime I was bad because I didn't have a relationship with Christ that uh, and so then mm -hmm. sin becomes exceedingly sinful my darkness becomes more dark mm -hmm. you know it, it's yeah. it compiles uh, one after the other and I start to see that it, it, God's not God's not so much concerned with the things that have done, yeah, that offends them, it's sin, but it's that he's offered his son yeah. and I'm rejecting him. Mm. And that just yeah. did, did something to me. And, you know, uh, I, I talk about it in platforms all over in more detail, but that was my, my moment. And decisions had to be made yeah. uh, going forward that would, uh, you know, uh, cause some harm. Uh, yeah. to my life while I was in there. But, you know, by the grace of God, I mean, here we are, 2024. Right. And God preserved me and, and his hand was upon me. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, throughout that time. It, it was tough. It was rough, yeah. but you know, it, it's it's for the Lord, and and yeah. that's it. That's how I look at it. You know, now yeah. and God protected you. Yeah, after man. you made that conversion and blessed you. But I like from that point when you made that conversion. How long were you still in prison before you had got out? Oh, I still had uh, another five, six years uh, mm. on top of that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah. it, 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 the first two years as a Christian in there. And here's the other thing. I think people will have this, this misconception that when you, when you get born again, when you become a Christian, that you're just pristine, clean. Yeah. God has, you know, your, yeah. your character is flawless. It, you're, you're that perfect guy now. And you're not, you know, yeah. even when you come to Christ, there is still a bunch of stuff that God has to chisel off of you. Mm -hmm. And for me, it, it was the pride, man, the pride. I, I think God had, yeah. and to, to this day, man, I have moments where you, I catch myself and, you know, and the Holy Spirit's going, hey, no, go ahead, don't, that, yeah. shouldn't be doing that. You know, uh, things that I say, uh, things that I do, yeah. that where God's already telling me, hey, pump the brakes. And I still do it. So mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work, you know, yeah. uh, that God has to do with me. But for me at, at that moment, it, it was pride. Because mm -hmm. I easily, you know, back then you didn't have S&Y yards. Mm -hmm. it, you had about two of them that were PC yards and everything else was, wow. it was good. It was solid. Yeah. So rolling it up, yeah. I could have easily went up to the gate and yeah. got a CO and said, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> Let me go to a, a PC yard, and, yeah. and that would have been, and PC yards were different back then, I, I, I would think. Yeah. It's, now they have gangs yeah, within yeah. uh, SNYs, yeah. uh, from what I hear. That wasn't the case back then. So I could have easily just went, yeah. roll me up, yeah. you know, my life's in danger, boom. But my pride, even as a Christian, mm. inside of me, I was like, nah, if you're going to want me out of this yard, you're going to have to roll me out of this yard. Like, I'm going to have to be dragged dead out of this yard. Uh, I didn't come in like a punk. I'm not going out like one. Yeah. And that, you know, <laughs> I think back now, and I'm like, yeah. what foolishness, man. What arrogance yeah. that, you know, that was still inside of me uh, to think that. Because really, it was still uh, the mentality of yeah. a gang member, uh, gangsterism. Yeah. You know, uh, no, nah, you, you have to take me out or take me out of this yard. Uh, but, you know, that happened. Yeah. I had to deal with it. And it wasn't, it wasn't good. Uh, you know, the term hard candy mm -hmm. uh, from back in the days. Uh, I don't know if that's even a term now, but. I don't think I've heard that one. <laughs> that was a, that's a different one. No, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> yeah. But hard candy was, yeah. you, you were going to get dealt, man. Yeah. You were going to get pummeled, you know, and yeah. there was a green light on you. Then that's, that's just how it was. And what grace, like, did God, even back then, when you still had all that pride and still was like, thinking oh. that God was still like clinging on to you, like helping you and guiding you and still being there for you and provided everything to come after that for you to get out. Like, that's just, that's powerful. Like, to, even when we're that, like, because I feel like everybody who's had a conversion, you don't like you said it's not like just a light <coughs> switch no and all of a sudden you're good and you do it it's like you got to go through like uh it's like a phase you know sometimes you relapse sometimes you'll have oh, yeah you know you'll still be manipulative you'll still do things that aren't right um and yet god still god's still there like yeah has your back and walking you through it so like how like what do you tell a person um because like you i speak at the um juvenile facilities and I went into LP um, last month and I spoke to like, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about like, here's the crazy thing when I went to speak at LP, I spoke to different pods, right? Different areas. Yeah, yeah. I go in one, I'm talking to them unscripted because you just have to go in there and feel it. Yeah. You can't go in there with like a present, you, know, you got to just go in there, talk to them real. Yeah. And a lot of them were like, um, you know, you could tell they were more like antsy and they were still like, they were asking a lot of questions about prison. And like you mentioned earlier, they really don't know, they didn't know how prison was. They thought completely different than what I said. So it kind of was an eye opener for them. Yeah. But then when I went to this other pod and I went in, it felt different. Like the mm. energy was different. And I started speaking and afterward, 
um, you know, kids were in there like reading, like in the day room. And I'm like, and so later one of the kids was like, do you know, this is um, a pot. Everybody in here is facing life. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, it hit me that like, man, like it's like um, prison, like it is similar to that, you know, where you feel that like you go to a level four, you go to maximum security, you're in the shoe, you're in those environments. It feels different than like if you're on a level two or something, yeah. you know what I mean? Or um, it's a darker cloud. It's a darker cloud, yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, but like in, in you know you being able to do that and God still being there with you is a yeah. powerful thing and a powerful message. Um, like, what would you tell somebody who might be listening to this who is on that fence? I would say, like, where they've given them their they want to or they've given their life um, to God to the Lord and there's still all those temptations around them, right? They still have to go back home to that neighborhood. Or they still have to go back from juvenile hall into that neighborhood, but they want to change. Like, what would you tell them on that journey? I, I think um, the 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 greatest fear and the greatest enemy is within. Mm-hmm. You know, we're scared of change. Right. We're scared of the unknown. You know, when I first came to Christ, that that question was, you know, who am I going to hang out with? Because mm-hmm. we're so used to a certain type of people, uh, a culture that we cling to, and stepping away from that, well, who, who are we going to hang out with? Who's going to be my friend, right? Mm-hmm. That, that question lingered. Uh, but God's so awesome that he provides uh, different people. You know, uh, I, I sat with some in- interesting folks now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what I thought, uh, what I had imagined that I would be, you know, an outcast because I've walked away from this culture, was not it. I mean, God provided. He's yeah. always a provider of all our needs. So I think that when we, to, to that question, I would say, you know, don't be scared of, of authentic change. Authentic change does cost. It does cost. There's going to be loneliness. There's going to be this and that, right? A loss of time and the, the 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 giggles that you had with the homeboys all that disappears but god's going to give you a greater joy that this world is incapable of giving you that man is incapable of giving you mm-hmm. you know and and that's what i i've experienced you know i'm going in uh, next week to the orange county uh, juvenile hall system mm. and going through pods and going yeah. through that and uh, and i love that it is unscripted yeah. It's in for me, uh, as as yourself, I think uh, I want to go in there and and not go. Hey, you know, uh, been there, done that, bought the shirt. You're right. But I want to go in there with a spirit of, uh, of of peace, and and a spirit of calmness. Yeah. And let them know, hey, you don't want to you don't want to go there. Yeah. There's nothing there. Yeah. It, it's a, and be real with them that. You know, because we're all looking for loyalty when we're in the gang, in that mm-hmm. whole gang culture. It's it's loyalty. Absolutely. It, you know, it's it's that brotherhood, but but you're going to follow rules. And I think that once, for me, when I when I speak to uh, somebody that's on a fence, I bring up that subject of loyalty. Mm-hmm. And when they hear that there's absolutely no loyalty in there, I don't care who it is that you grew up with, who your homeboy that you, you know, did the spread with, mm-hmm. that kicked you down with whatever need you needed, yeah. you know, that supplied this or that, that hung out. That's the guy that will most likely be asked to do something to you. So loyalty is just doesn't exist mm-hmm. in that culture. When you come to to the Lord and, 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 you've, and God has, you know, taken over your, your your mind, your soul, your heart, mm-hmm. you'll only find loyalty in him. And I think that's that's helped me so much in my life out here as well. Yeah. That I I'm okay with someone being unloyal to me now. Mm. Because they're human. Yeah. Uh, that's putting too much cream on the taco uh, <laughs> on somebody and thinking that they're going to come through. Yeah. <laughs> They're human. They're gonna. Yeah. They're. They're. You know. They're full of flaw and and error. They're gonna let you down, but God won't. 
And that's the so, big difference, you yeah. know. So for somebody that's on the fence, man, get get real with the Lord and, and, and just uh, ask him to reveal himself to you, yeah. and he will. You know, yeah. I, I know he will. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I would say to somebody. Yeah. And they're playing a losing game. Oh, yeah. You man. know, I tell them that, like, with the youth and even, like, older individuals, like, it. You're, you know, it's just a matter of time. And do That's you want it. to be on a losing game? You know, do you want to give your life to something that you're guaranteed to lose in? Yeah. Like you said, in all aspects, you know, their freedom, their their loyalties that they think exist. Mm -hmm. um, people that are their friends now, they'll lose them in yeah. some way. Yeah. It's like so much. So when I frame it that way, they kind of like their eyes get really big and they start right. to think. <laughs> but um, they also ask me, in, uh, like, how do I go back to the same environment Um if I'm changed or if like how how do I deal with that like the the homeboys that are used to seeing me involved um even family who yeah. look at you a certain way that you have to change and now be a different person around them like how do they go back to that and be and still make it through that like what would you say to that because um I mean I didn't even have a clear enough answer for them on that yeah. um, because it's so deep of a question <coughs> but like I'd love to get your perspective on that I, I And I say this to when I go into prisons uh, with adult inmates as well as to mm -hmm. young, you know, gang prevention programs or, or such. I always say if, if to those that are incarcerated, you know, there's a way of you paroling outside of where you came from. And I think that is the smartest thing to do, mm -hmm. to be paroled, to ask to be paroled somewhere else, mm. somewhere far. Even if it's a, you know, if it's a program that you need to yeah. partake of. Do that, yeah. but be out of what you used to know and who knew you in these areas because right now it's, a, it's you, it's you time. Yeah. It's, it's time for you to reshape, remold, and, and, and figure things out. Yeah. And if you're in the same area, in the same cluster of you know, people, mm -hmm. the temptation is going to be too big and, and, and the influence. So don't think that you're above that. Mm -hmm. I would say separate yourself from that. Sometimes I've learned that it's okay to cut some people off, even for a moment. Yeah. Some you're going to have to cut off, just mm -hmm. boom, and separate yourself for a long time. And that's okay because, number one, as we know, freedom, <laughs> that's precious, man. Yeah. That, that's, freedom is all, man. That's it. And, and, and when you don't have that, because it could be one moment of you you go back to the neighborhood to what's familiar and it could take one incident and that one incident takes you back in. Yeah. So uh, for me, you know, back then when I paroled, there was no mass liberation. There was no uh, ARC. Mm -hmm. There was no programs. There was $200 gate money, figure it out. Yeah. That's all there was. Yeah. You know, there was, there was, there was nothing else. And so you had to want to, to change. And so for me, I ended up paroling somewhere else. I asked for that uh, to a city that I wasn't familiar with. No one knew me. I didn't know. There was gangs, but, you know, the, to me, there weren't L.A. gangs. So, you yeah. know, I could work my, myself through that. Yeah. And I did, man. And that was the best decision I ever made. So I think separating ourselves from the normal, what that, mm -hmm. the influence, the people that we knew, <laughs> you're going to be so far ahead. If you just take the risk and the change to move. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be uncomfortable. I get it. But right. it's going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be in a better place. And so I always suggest that. Yeah. Do whatever it takes to, to, and if you're out, if you're out here and you're trying to make that change, do the same thing. Now I get it. It's difficult, right? Mm. Uh, for these kids because it's the parents that, mm -hmm are the breadwinners and their, their housing. I would, I would do whatever it takes, man, to convince that parent to move. And I think parents would, especially nowadays, yeah. uh, they're more informed than I think the parents that I had, yeah. you know, now with modern technology and everything, mm -hmm. you can get around uh, things a lot more than, yeah. than or back go then. with like an uncle. If you know, like if you have, yes. if you have a relative that's out somewhere, 
that there's not that ask to just come stay with them. That's right. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's such a bold move. It's a bold move. move, move. <laughs> but that's what's necessary. Right? Yes, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's um that's such great advice, and I think it's very uncomfortable, like you said. But it's when we're uncomfortable that we're it's when that's when we grow most. Yeah. Right, when we put ourselves in uncomfortable situations, and either way, you might as well get uncomfortable out free. Then you're going to prison. <laughs> you're gonna really be uncomfortable. Then you're really gonna be uncomfortable. Yeah, so <laughs> might as well do it on your own accord. That's right. So when did you parole? And um, you think you said you got out with two hundred dollars, and they still do that, by the way. Uh, two hundred dollar <laughs> gate money. Except now they give you like on a prepaid credit card. Oh, right. they give you cash back. Then. Cash back then, yeah, yeah. So now they give you a prepaid cash. I mean, I was card. in the county jail, and you could actually still have cash. That's crazy. Yeah, that's way before my time. Yeah, now you get a write up if you have cash. Now. Oh, really? You get in trouble for that. A serious one fifteen? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> contraband for having money, right? But um, yeah, and so when did you parole, and how did you get from two hundred dollars gate money to relocating to a new place to where you're at now? I mean, with all of your accomplishments, all the things you're doing, all the influence you have, like how did that happen? That's that's it's crazy when I think about that. So like, how did that all come together? You know what? I uh, so I get out with with two hundred bucks in my pocket. By the time I get downtown LA uh, that day that I paroled, uh, I have about eighty bucks because you're paying for the Greyhound. Mm-hmm. I still have my Greyhound ticket, by the way. Oh shit! You got to frame that. Like, yeah. I still have yeah. my my uh, the the uh, the the yeah. band from uh, LA wow. County Jail. You still remember your CDC number? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It'll yeah. never go. Yeah, right? it'll never. You'll never forget yeah. that. Uh, I'm an H number, so. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing him in prison. Like you know, he's been down a long time. And yeah, you just see, like he's a B number a B or number, C, number. C number. Yeah, like man, that guy's been in for a while. Yeah, yeah, crazy. <laughs> but yeah, so but so I I get out in uh, in '95. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jul- this is the funny part. July 3rd, uh, right wow. before Fourth of July, I get out and yeah. um, uh, I moved to San Pedro, California. Mm-hmm. And for me, San Pedro was you know it's a it's the end of the 110 freeway. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, mostly a veteran, retiree kind of community there. Mm-hmm. And there's, I think, like two gangs up there. Yeah. But they're not, you know. Yeah. It's not infested. It's, it's not infested like yeah, L.A., yeah. like the Rampart District. You know? right. So for me, that was a, safest, a safe haven for me. I did that, and uh, my, I, I had a hard time getting a job because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's no prior work uh, yeah. history. Uh, my uncle was the one that gave me a break. He owned a uh, hardware floor company, mm-hmm. and he gave me a, a quebrada. And mm-hmm. and I asked him. I said, "Hey, can I can I get a job with you?" And I said, "I don't know anything about construction, but yeah. I'll pick up, you know, the garbage. I'll yeah. clean up after everybody." And that's what I did. Nice. And that was my first. The, the the first three hundred bucks that I ever got for actually working an honest job was the best feeling, man. One of the best feelings I ever had was mm-hmm. that I broke my like I busted my tail, mm-hmm. you know, in this construction site for those three hundred bucks. But it was honest work. No one got hurt. Mm-hmm. No one was taxed. It, it it there was this sense of pride, man. Uh, this wholesome pride. That, that took over and I liked it. And so I worked uh, for him for a while and then uh, I stayed away from, from everybody, man. No one even knew that I was out. Mm. And it wasn't until, I remember, uh, I don't know, they, they still have that, but your parole agent, the state could give you a, 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 a ducket for clothes. For, for yeah. The, so yeah, they still have like vouchers. Vouchers, like, yeah. they were called ducats. Yeah. Then. And so I asked for one and <laughs> we came to a, Across the street from one of those high schools that I attended, I got kicked out of oh, Menu sweet. Arts. Yeah. There was a surplus store right across the street uh, around that neighborhood, and so my pro agent went with me, and uh, you know got the clothes. And as we were checking out, a bunch of my homeboys walk in mm. and saw me, wow. and uh, that was a little awkward, you know, because yeah. I hadn't said nothing to anybody, and and yeah, you know, they they you know there was a little talk yeah uh but i shook the spot really quick got in his car and we jammed uh so i did that uh that's another thing man i think that you know when you lived in a life of 
incarceration where you did have influence and mm-hmm. you were a gang leader or whatever it was, right? You had pool. And you come out, it's okay to work that minimum wage job. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. It is honorable. It is good. You're going to learn some, some yeah. stuff in it. And it's God who promotes you. It's God who, who gives you the next break. Yeah. So for me, it was just baby steps, man. I did that. Uh, I worked so I, I used to work two jobs. Uh, I came to a time where I worked three jobs. Mm-hmm. And I'm on four hours of sleep. On the bus, mind you. On the bus. and <laughs> man, uh, no and excuses. No man. excuses, dude. Yeah. I still wake up at four in the morning. To yeah. this day. From the, from the joint out to this day, four in the, in the morning I'm up. Uh, so that discipline, you know, mm-hmm. you learn a lot of stuff in there, man. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I put in my hours there. And it was while I was uh, volunteering for this one uh, little small church that I was drawing a, a banner. I always knew how to draw. And uh, it was for a youth, uh, 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 it was like a concert mm-hmm. and for this little small church that we were in. And I was drawing this banner on, on butcher paper on the floor. Mm-hmm. And this guest drummer came in, who I never saw in my life. Uh-huh. And uh, he looked at my, at my drawing, because this church, yeah. back then, if you got like a, a, a standard three by 10 banner, three yeah. feet by 10 feet, yeah. You're talking about 500 bucks, 700 bucks. Well, a small church can't afford that. That's not in the yeah. budget. It's a lot of money. So I took what I, you know, spray cans, markers, mm-hmm. and drew this banner out. And this drummer comes in, and he sees uh, me drawing this thing. And he says, man, he says, what do you do? What do you do for a living? Yeah. And I told him. Man, I said, oh, I got two jobs. <clears throat> and I told him what I was doing. He goes, you ever thought about doing uh, uh, science? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, like electrical signs, mm-hmm. signs for buildings. Yeah. I said, I don't know anything about that. He goes, why don't you come on Monday, if you got some time, and I'll show you around my shop. Yeah. Little did I know, and here's that thing, man. It only takes one person to change a lot that will go on uh, in your life, man. Absolutely. And this is, this is the first guy that God brings into my life that would change mm-hmm. my financial status of that. Yeah. I went to a shop. I interned for him for two years. So you earned free it. Free labor. Yeah. But what I was learning was the manufacturing of a sign, how to build a sign, mm-hmm. how to design a sign. And I remember I, I fell in love with building signs. Mm-hmm. Like I'm talking about the ones that go on like high rises, yeah. and like the real deal yeah. stuff. And fell in love with that. And then about uh, a year and a half into it, uh, so I've been interning for that. So for the last six months, he takes me out of that to going in and listening to him close mm-hmm. deals. And I hated that part. Because I wanted to be with the boys. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to be with these dudes that were, you know, welding. And yeah. you could hear metal clashing and cutting. The machinery, yeah. the loudness. I loved that. Not the boring. Not the boring yeah, sitting yeah, and trying yeah. to close a deal. Yeah. And I remember being in this hospital. Uh, he was doing a bid to this big major hospital. And we're in this big board meeting. And the check comes from hand to hand, yeah, and I hold it, it comes to me, he's sitting right here, and I see the amount, and that was just a deposit. Mm. And, and he looked at me and he goes, you gonna let that go? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm looking at this yeah. and I'm going, wow. And I handed it to him, and we went outside, and I said, man, th- th- that's real money, huh? <laughs> and he goes, that's real money, man. Yeah. He goes, uh, this is why I'm bringing you to these, mm-hmm. to these meetings with me. There's something more about you mm-hmm. than you even know. And sometimes it takes somebody else seeing what's in there. Yeah. Sometimes we're just blind to the capabilities that already are built in, inside of us. And he, uh, you know, uh, long story short, the guy that taught him yeah. decided to retire at 52. And I would end up buying that company out mm. uh, within about a year from that 
that point. Yeah. I bought that uh, way. It came with 42 accounts, uh, 6,000 square foot uh, shop. And um, man, I just ran with it. Within the first year, mm -hmm. I had made a little over $200,000. Mm. Uh, the third year, it rose to 380. Mm -hmm. And by my fifth year, I was already making half a million dollars net yeah. in sign making. And this is without a GED. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. a, without a good enough diploma yeah. with no formal education. And it just went on and on from there. And, you know, later on, the, the book yeah. uh, would get published by HarperCollins, which that is, that was huge. That's amazing. Uh, that, that's that's like bringing a script to Warner Brothers and them yeah. signing off on it. Yeah. So that 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 took place, and and now right now we're uh, we're in the final stages of they're making a motion picture film about my story, about the first nice. book. So that's this next stage that I'm in, and it's incredible, man. But this is what God has done. Yeah. He's the one that has done this, and yeah. and, and I look at you know I walk in here and I look at that. And that lady was right, man. Yeah. That lady was right. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I, that was yeah. my turning point. That's when it happened. And, man, this is like when I think about that, what you said, I just look at it like you put in, if you work hard, right, if you work hard, you don't give up, and yeah. you're okay with taking chances, yeah. you, you will eventually find success yeah you know and that's like proof of what you just said right there you got out you started working hard for a little bit of money um you know eventually you somebody noticed something within you that you didn't see and gave you an opportunity and you did the right thing with the opportunity and then when you had the opportunity you continued to make good decisions like man that's but that was because of the work that you put in yeah. um, and i understand like i've been out three years <laughs> And I kind of like, I'm feeling that like, um, from 95 yeah, to 2024, this yeah. is what, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, man. So, um, I, you know, I love that because it kind of like seeing you and your success kind of like validates for me that I'm on the right path and that yeah. I just keep going and, you know, um, I'm going to continue to reach my goals and I'm super grateful for everything I have like right yeah. now. I think we, it's in our DNA to continue to want to do more because we want to create more impact in the yeah. world. Like your movie is going to create impact far beyond um, probably what you've already done, your books. So I like I always have that feeling too, but I also have a sense that you're just extremely grateful for oh, everything man. that you have. Like and I could feel that, like, you know what I mean? Just good energy. And so I truly commend you. And you're only, what, 52, 54? 52. 52. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny because, well, it's not funny, but um, when you told me your age earlier, um, it made me think about my, my brother-in-law who just died he, he lost his battle mm. with cancer um july 31st just not too long ago so um days ago yeah. and he battled with it for so long he did 12 years in prison he got out he um met my sister raised her kids because their father died at a very young age stepped up raised them put him through sports did great things for him impacted them did the right thing and you know caught cancer and lost the battle and he was so young, and mm. it was like I still haven't fully processed it. I don't. I, I mean, him and I weren't really close because I was in prison most of the time he was around. But I used to think about my niece and nephew and worry about them. But when he came into their life, he kind of like eased that for me. So I really respected him. Yeah, and he was a good man. So I and I prayed about the situation. You know, he was suffering at the end, and I prayed to God eased his suffering. Um, and he passed, but. There's always that question, and it's like that big question that everybody asks, like, why do good, bad things happen to good people who, um, you know, you feel like doesn't deserve that or doesn't deserve to suffer and fight through cancer and then die at a young age? Like, that's a hard question for me whenever I get it. But I wanted to ask you what your perspective was on that um, as a man of God and having a deep understanding of that life. Uh, I would say, I would refer back to, uh, that one earlier scripture, uh, there's none that does good, no, not one. Mm. So when you look at that and you go, whoa, right? Because it's a sensitive subject. I mean, yeah. somebody has just passed from 
a disease that is incurable. Uh, but then there's also the, the sovereignty of God. Mm-hmm. And God knows uh, when our last day is. He holds it. You know, and it's a mystery. We don't know. I mean, I could go to sleep tonight and, and that's, yeah. I check out. Right. You know, it's what you do while you still have breath. And this is why it's so important. James, uh, the letter of, uh, of James in the New Testament talks about our life being like a mist. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it appears and then it's gone. Right. That's how fragile life is. And so while you're living, the choice of accepting Christ into your heart, it has an expiration date. And it's when we expire. Mm-hmm. And there's no going back to that. So while you're living, that decision has to be made mm-hmm. to follow Christ, to accept him as, as the sovereign Lord, as, as everything. So that when, and when we pass, it's not a matter of if, it's when we pass, we've made peace with him. And, uh, and mm-hmm. our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's so important. I think that so many of us, man, so, and it's common, it's human nature. We want to be in control of us, our successes, our accomplishments, or whatever it is, you know. But, man, you're going to see, you know, we prepare for appointments. Everyone prepare for, for, prepares for appointments. If you're going to a job interview, yeah. you're going to prepare for that job interview. Mm-hmm. If you, if I were to say, hey, Carlos, uh, tomorrow you're going to go see uh, uh, the President of the United States, you're not just going to put just anything on. You're not going to be late. You're going to be well prepared. You'll be nervous, but you're going to be on time. You're going to be prepared for that appointment. And that's just because you're meeting a president, another man. So we prepare for doctor visits. We prepare for, you know, when uh, parent night. Well, at your children's school, we prepare for all these things, attorneys, all of that. But we fail to prepare for the most important appointment that everyone has. And that's that appointment when you meet Christ. Because that's guaranteed. You're going to meet Christ. Uh, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's an appointment <laughs> that a lot of people fail to prepare for. And the only way is to accept Christ now while there's still breath in our lungs and then live according to the scriptures as much as we can uh, and obey him so that when we meet him, we're good. You know, I, 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 what good does it, you know, the Bible says, what, what good does it if, if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul in hell? <laughs> that, man, dude, you talking about a prison sentence? A life without? That's real life without right there. Yeah. To be thrown into, into hell forever. And God doesn't throw anybody into hell. That's a decision that we make. So I think this is where it goes. And, and um, I, I always, when I go into uh, gang prevention programs or juvenile halls or prisons, my whole goal is to not highlight my su- my success uh, is to highlight him. Yeah, uh, what he's done in my life and continues to do through my life. He's he's my all man. He's he's everything. Yeah. Anything and everything that I have is because of him. And there is no other. Uh, he's all. You yeah. know. Uh, so I I I I hope I did some justice to that question. And it's a harsh reality. I yeah. get it. You know, it, it's, but it's real. Yeah. And so I, I think um, taking a look at our, you know, we have life insurance. Right. You know, we have this insurance for that. that, And we've, we kind of neglect life assurance. Yeah. And, and that's so, it's like, we, like you said, you said something very powerful. We prepare for everything else, but we don't prepare for the most important time in our existence Mm -hmm. um and everybody it's not it's not if it's when you know it's when and if we reframe things just by changing a word makes you think different yeah you know like some people 
probably walk through the world feeling like immortal. They're not ever going to yeah. go or they're not ever going to have their moment, but it can happen at any time. So how are you living today? That's right. And are you right with God? Are you right yeah. with those that matter? Have you, are you living every day the, the, the life you want to live? Because yeah. it's such a precious time. And that's, so that's super powerful. So I was looking at the sign that's right behind your shoulder, the Shot Caller podcast. Talk about your podcast uh, for those who may not know it. Um, it's on all the podcast platforms. Um, but talk about that. Like, what kind of guests do you have on? What is the, the overall um, mission behind this podcast? And why is it important for you to, to be a podcast host? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's really interesting because I think we, uh, I was able to, uh, uh, again, by God's wisdom, uh, able to, to form something that is very rare uh, because in this podcast we interview uh, people that have been incarcerated most of their life and then the other half of it is high-ranking law enforcement and so I've had captains lieutenants and yeah. you name it they've been here uh, FBI agents and to have them at the table and, yeah. and to talk and discuss and and, and share life uh, it, it's really interesting. I, I don't think I've seen another podcast like that where, it, no. where we sit at the table. In fact, every Saturday morning for the last nine years, we, we have a Bible study of men, a men's Bible study. We meet here at nine in the morning here in this room next door. Wow. And half of them uh, are ex-convicts and half of them are. <laughs> there's uh, major crime uh, detectives. There's wow. uh, robbery homicide detectives. There's FBI agents that come here. Yeah. And we sit and crack open, open the Bible, and we have a Bible study. And yeah. for the past nine years, this has, has been, and people don't know. I've kept it very private. I don't yeah. advertise it, yeah. but we're doing life together. I mean, we were just at a restaurant yesterday after the Bible study at, at a, here in, a, in the city, mm -hmm. uh, having lunch and laughing. Yeah. laughing our socks off yeah. uh, because one of the dudes that had the time, yeah. you know, uh, still, he's 70 years old. And he still talks like, like one of the homeboys, right? Yeah, yeah, he he yeah, couldn't yeah. shake that off, and yeah. we were all laughing because there's, yeah, the, you know, there's. And I said this to to everybody. I said, "Do you understand what's going on here? Yeah. This would have never happened unless Christ made it happen." So the yeah. podcast deals with that, um, but we also talk about politics and policies. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, one of my segments is is a Bible study that I do with. Uh, uh, with the uh, a DA uh, uh, investigator, wow. you know, yeah. <laughs> and he's active uh, yeah. in, in the office of that. But we do a Bible study with him, uh, and we, we, you know, go into yeah. we dive deep into the, to the scriptures. So that's the podcast. It's it's a, it's very unique, um, and uh, it has quite a following. Uh, people, uh, for some reason, man, uh, I guess uh, uh, just. You know, I, I love hearing uh, their comments. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll get a text once I yeah. release a, a segment, uh, an episode, and the texts that come in, you know, man, dude, uh, this or that. It, it does do something to your soul. Yeah. It, it puts a, a smile on your face that, yeah. man, it's touching lives. It's We're being heard in 59 countries, I think, the last time I checked. Whoa. That's a lot of countries. Um, Absolutely. You know, and... and you know, I look at the list and I'm yeah. like, wow, man, that's crazy that man. there's people in the Middle East, in the Middle East, you yeah. know, in Canada and in Russia. And, yeah. And they're listening to this. I think that's what makes podcasting so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's I'm having a blast doing it. And, yeah. and, and I hope that it helps people think. Uh, you know, my subject matter is, is very... Uh, uh, opposite, uh, uh, going against the grain on some of the, uh, for instance, the uh, policies and mm -hmm. uh, or political. Yeah. But I think it's important to see different sides as well. Yeah. You know, I've had uh, people that ha have been Democrats in here, mm -hmm. and I've talked to them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's important to have dialogue with someone that you may not agree with. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let's talk about it. Let's be adults and talk about it. I think that's that's what I that's my focus on on this podcast yeah. is come to the table. Let's talk. Yeah, I you love know? that. And yeah. you're 
you're doing what a lot of people would have said is impossible to do you know bringing two different i mean because at some point you know those other the police officers or district attorney the fbi agents were like sworn enemies for life yeah you know that was the mindset when you're in that gang life and you're just anti everything that correctional officers and to like you never like people back then i mean i know i would have thought it been possible to get them two in the room formerly incarcerated ex convict <laughs> you know gang leaders yeah. and these guys in a room to, but like you said the power of god yeah right that's how you you come together yeah. is you know and that's actually a powerful um thing that just came to me because um when you talk about politics and like the division in this country all mm-hmm. the stuff going on um and it's like if maybe it's you know through god that these opposite parties and belief systems and things have to come together on yeah. because other than that it's like you know like i tell oh, yeah. yeah it's crazy like i tell you I, I don't know i'm not married but the people that i know that have successful marriages always say the thing that's kept them together is always there's God, there's Christ, yeah. there's the that's church. It. That's the thing that's kept them together through yep. all the struggle. And it makes sense because when I look at those who don't have that, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So in the marriage, it's a relationship. So it's like you have to, you have different belief systems. You come together for the betterment of the family. I mean, I just thought about that. Like that might be a good, you know, message um, for, for in politics, you know, because yeah. um, I think both sides, Democrats, Republicans believe in, they have believers. Yeah. Maybe that's a good way to segue, but... Um, yeah, look, I, I just came from uh, renewing my vows after 25 years with my wife. That's amazing. Just in, in Hawaii, uh, we had a great that's time beautiful. there, and, and you know, uh, I can't believe that she stuck around. <laughs> but but yeah. it, it was the Lord, it was Christ in the center of our marriage that has yeah. made this possible. Yeah. And He continues to be yeah. who leads us in our family, yeah. in our, you know, adventures. Yeah. It, it's Him all the way through. And that's beautiful. And... It's like this podcast here is just like the tip of the iceberg of you as a person in your journey and everything. Like you just talk about being married for that long. That's a whole other thing that you can, <laughs> people would love to like gain from you is like just how to do that. But how can people like stay connected with you, follow you, find you, get your book, um, all that? Because I, if, if you're listening to this, man, there's so much more than what was spoken here today. Right. This man has done so much and is accomplishing so much. So how can people find you and reach you? Um, on Instagram, uh, it's uh, the real uh, Casey Diaz. On Facebook, it's uh, Casey Diaz author. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and I'm easy to find. Yeah. Uh, pictures there. I like interacting with uh, different people, uh, talking. And, and uh, you know, when, when, when we first started the whole uh, Instagram thing and all mm-hmm. of that, uh, I, I was very new to that, very fresh to that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, I remember one of them, one of the PR people saying, just keep it business, you know, just. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, nah, man, I'm just, I, I'm always a, a guy that's going to break yeah. the rule, you know. Yeah. So I put funny stuff. I yeah. put, you know, and, and some of it has, a lot of it has to do with, you know, yeah. the life that we lived and everything. But I think humor is so needed, man, especially today, man. Yeah. You know, uh, the eggs are expensive. The gas yeah. is up there. You know, let, let's yeah. laugh about some of these things. Yeah. And, and let's, you know, kick it. You know, don't, yeah. don't be so uh, caught in the moment of, you know, this anxiety or mm-hmm. whatever is going out there. Uh, look for opportunities to have a good laugh at. Yeah. And so I put these things on, on Instagram and you yeah. know, uh, and, and I like the baby stuff. Like, yeah, you had you had one that oh, went viral. Yes, that thing was like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like I don't know, fifteen yeah. million people watching that. But thing. people, yeah. that's what I said, people need that. Like, yeah, man, man. that's that's like that's important. Like, yeah, I like the fact you said you break the rules because I'm kind of the same way. People tell yeah. me to do things a certain way. I'm like, I just want to do things the way I feel I want to do them. That yeah. people need, you know, yeah. being authentic. Yeah, being you. Yeah, you know, uh, I I crack jokes to this yeah. day, man. I. I love laughing, man. I love, yeah. you know, a, a good you know, chuckle and, yeah. and, and you know, so it's all good, man. I, yeah. uh, I'm enjoying what, what God has, has me doing and, and yeah. meeting uh, interesting folks, man. Yeah. Yeah. What's your call to action to people listening? My call to action? Man, don't, don't, don't stay in, in, in water that doesn't move. Mm. Don't stay in water that doesn't move. Uh, you know, you keep a, get a cup and pour water in there and you leave it outside. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, 
nobody's going to drink that later on. Yeah. Because it's gotten flies, it's gotten all kinds of debris in there. Go and make something, you know, write things down. I'm a big person of just write things down. Yeah. You know, uh, physically get a pen and a notebook. Man, in the garage I have, I mean, boxes of all my notebooks, of all my journaling. Yeah. I keep them, and from time to time, I'll go in there and crack open a box, and they're dated, the time stamped, and I know exactly where, where I was at and when I wrote it. These things are important. Every yeah. successful person that I know, every multimillionaire that, I sat, mm -hmm. that, that I've sat down with, the qualities are the same. They wake up very early. They write things down. They don't use an iPad or, an, or a phone. They write things down the old school way. And, and, and man, their success level is just, yeah. you know, it just, it's booming. Yeah. You know, uh, am I where I want to be? No. Uh, I'll still say it. Yeah. I'm not where I want to be. I know that there's a lot more. Uh, and I'm going after it. Yeah. Uh, by God's grace. I want to die empty. Mm. Yeah. I want to die empty. When I leave this earth, I want to know that I used every resource and every gift and talent possible that God put into, in, into the soul. Yeah. I want to die empty. And yeah. that's my goal. Beautiful. Yep. And success leaves clues. So, like yeah. you said, <laughs> and, and it's out there for us to learn. And, um, Thank you so much, uh, Casey, for this interview. Uh, I, like, I'm just honored to be here with you. Um, and just know that, like, <clears throat> the work you're doing, um, you know this, it's having influence on people. And, but, you know, I don't know how many oftentimes you get somebody that sits across for you and tells you that your work has influenced them directly. So I just wanted to tell you that, that when I first got out, I was fresh out. And um, I was working for Sister Mary Sean of PrEP. And she gave me my first job, part-time, uh, writing letters to the prisoners inside, uh, just, you know, self-help groups. And um, another friend told me about you and what you were doing and introduced me to your Instagram page. And, you know, as I was building mine from the ground up, I was always, like, seeing you. And it was just inspiring me to keep going and um, one day have a podcast, one day have a platform, a book, uh, speak, um, impact lives. So I just want to say thank you for this time. Thank you for that. Um, and keep doing your work, man. You're doing amazing. You're doing God's work and the leading example. Carlos, the honor is mine, man. I, and I say that uh, because, you know, uh, uh, I, to me it brings me joy, man, that, that you're here. And, uh, yeah, I, I look at your stuff in there, man, and and just you're on the right track, brother. Just, just keep going. And God's going to, uh, in, the, in the famous words of uh, Francis Proctor, he loves you and he's going to use you. That's it, man. You know, uh, I know that he is. And just keep yeah. keep doing what you're doing, man. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Amen. Yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.